All right. I think I'll just start. I've, I already pressed the record on the camera, so those who aren't here can um, I might get the chance later to uh, hear what I have to say. So, um, uh, Salve is my name. Um, um, a few months ago, I learned about these two, two new laws. I didn't take any attention, make, a, make any attention to it. I thought, like, okay, EU is doing its thing again. And then some people started saying, oh crap, this is going to affect lots of businesses. And then at the same time, someone asked, um, uh, the thing that they're affecting is code, and most businesses, uh, like between 60 and 98% I've heard, use open source software. So there will be consequences for regular people who just have their own open source stuff. And that's when I'm trying to give you a little bit of an overview here of for today. A little bit of the context. Um, see if it, this works. Uh, if you have questions, let's wait a little bit at the, to the end. Um, Laura has a microphone so we can get your questions on the uh, recording. So please uh, give signal to him when the time comes. And let's see if we can get something into, get into this. So let's start with the, the first of two laws. It's a NIST 2 directive. Um, it is already uh, accepted. It's a directive, it means that EU says each country has to make its own version of this law. It, uh, the deadline for that is uh, in October 2024, at which point they will say this is now law. So we, are, we have some time before the shit hits the fan. Okay, I'm a bit being a little bit ne negative here, so you can sh put salt or sugar on my what, what I say here after your own taste. Um, but I'm trying to uh, wave my hands and say this is kind of important, so I, I hope you uh, appreciate it anyway. Uh, NIST 2 directive is about securing critical infrastructure. So you can think about your water uh, uh, treatment plants, your power plants, uh, anything that has to do with uh, uh, transport or hospitals or uh, how uh, important communication happens, like telecom or internet service providers, and related uh, all kinds of situ uh, uh, institutions or businesses that make something happen that we cannot kind of live without in the case of a, uh, in the situation there is a crisis or, or some catastrophe or something like an earthquake, for example, and they. The point here is to create some transparency with it in such a way that these critical infrastructures are more resilient towards uh, uh, failure and hacking and bugs and all, that, all kinds of stuff. Let's see. Um, these, uh, these laws, both of them, explicitly they say this doesn't apply directly to open source. But we'll get more into that. Because there, while there are no, maybe no direct consequences, the, the indirect ones I hope to convince you that are, are uh, serious. Uh, and EU uses this uh, in order to hit them with a club, saying we want this improved. And the club they have is fines up to 10 million euros in this case, or 2% of global revenue, which is higher, and the possibility of management fines, and maybe even more serious stuff. A little bit unclear of what the level is here, because this, uh, I'm, I'm, I haven't read everything, but I've read that this is like on the table. You, you might want to talk with your lawyer at your business. Um, so the risks here, if uh, a business who this applies to 
uh, doesn't do their due diligence, doesn't uh, have the, uh, the systems in place, doesn't uh, uh, know how to document that their, their security assessment and uh, response routines are uh, in place and working, they, they can get a little bit of a clap on the, on the, on the hand. Um, and who does it apply to? There are two types of entities. They're called essential and important entities. Um, all large and medium-sized companies in the European economic area, including Norway and Switzerland, a couple places, are considered at least important. Uh, but uh, there are some ones of these which are considered essential no matter the size. So you might have a tiny company with three employees who run an, uh, 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 a domain registrar for a bunch of domains. And they might be considered an essential one, depending on what they do. What's the bottom size of medium size? Uh, uh, around 250-ish uh, employees, and uh, that's what they, uh, that's what I've been told at least. And it also goes for companies who want to do business in EU, like with the GDPR. If you are in the United States and want to uh, have customers in the European Union, you have to be prepared to. Uh, follow some of these laws. Um, it kind of depends. There's a lot to this. Uh, and lawyers need to be involved. I'm going to give you like a, just a rough idea of what's going on so you can become appropriately scared. Um, so what's demanded from the NIST2 directory? They want to make these types of businesses that have to do with uh, critical infrastructure, to have an all hazards appro approach to the risk assessment uh, for their IT systems. That means do a proper risk assessment, like look what kind of attack vectors that are available, look at the possible consequences, the likelihood of it to be broken, um, go thoroughly through it. If, if there's some internal uh, uh, attackers, uh, like a uh, and former employee who, did, uh, who hates their boss but didn't get their um, access rights revoked. That's an attack vector. You have to look at the risk and the consequences and appropriate, do appropriate measures to mitigate. This, are, this is really sensible stuff, actually. Um, there's also new demands on incident handling and crisis management and stuff like that. That means if uh, you get an, uh, 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 there is a zero dead or something and some of your components are vulnerable because of this, you have to be able to quickly respond to that. That means if you have software that's unable to be updated properly and quickly, you kind of have to make sure that it is up updatable at some point so that you can re respond fast enough. Um, part of this has to also to do with uh, uh, business continuity, supply chain security, use of cryptography, proper access control policies, use of multi-factor uh, uh, authentication if needed. It's strictly speaking sensible stuff, a lot of work to do. If you have something that is exposed and critical, you have to get your act together if you don't already have your act together. The cool thing here is they try to be explicit about it so that you get uh, instructions actually, not, not always directly in the law, but uh, so they're, they're talk, talk about um, what's called the uh, standards of different types that will be published eventually. And that's a bit of, uh, uh, unknown yet, but by the time this goes into effect, we should expect at least some common good practices are known. And if you start now with the doing 
try to get best practices up and running, like follow good ideas on how to avoid common vulnerabilities, become, uh, get to know OWASP's lists of, of how to, uh, the stuff they ask, uh, is, uh, these things you should try to fix in your code, then you're probably fine. And the, they want you to document that you have pr procedures for vulnerability handling and disclosure and incident notification. If you have an incident, you get an early not notification by tw in 24 hours to some whatever cert or something. And um, one of the things they want to also make sure is that you ha we have basic hygiene when it comes to security. Like, secure by default. If you install something, it isn't in a insecure state out of the box. No more admin, admin, username and password anywhere, <laughs> for example. That's, that's, they want to quit that. And there's more. Sectors who are affected by this directive. Networks communication, banking, financial, healthcare, waste management, space, digital service, social media, public administration, energy, water supply, pharmaceuticals, postal. There's a lot and there's more. The couple of links I can share with you guys uh, la later that you can look at. Chances are some of you will be affected at work. Chances are these will be using open source projects in their stack. Some of these types of fields uh, of businesses that operate in this these fields uh, will be using Perl and CPAN and they will be starting to ask questions. Uh, how can we get uh, full control of what's going on when it comes to security incidents and communication and all that stuff? So uh, here's a couple, oops, uh, a bug in the slides. Some, some interesting links. I'll share the slides with you afterwards and make it available. Uh, I'll, I'll share the slides. We'll see if we'll, we'll see if we publish this. I think I'll publish this, this um, link here, this recording on the Oslo PM uh, YouTube channel as an unlisted video and then share the, the, it with you guys and then uh, we'll see if it will become listed uh, somehow. We'll, depends on if it's, the content is okay and you guys are good at asking questions. Um, then there's the second act here. There are more laws than these two that are relevant, but these two are, for, at least in, from my perspective, the important ones. The Cyber Resilience Act is a, a regulation that means the moment it uh, is accepted, it will become law all over the European Union. And everybody has to follow it. I'm not that, I think it's also relevant for European economic area like Norway and Switzerland and etc. Um, it has not been finished. The final rounds of comments that they're doing are happening today and tomorrow. So, and there's literally a law in the making right now. Um, they want to increase the security around uh, devices that have digital components, that's their language. Like switches that you have at home for, or routers, wireless routers, toys that are online, uh, any kind of thing where you might look at a CE mark. I mean, uh, if you have some electronics, uh, you might notice that uh, there is a, like a, a C and an E, which has a very distinct uh, logo kind of style. That's uh, basically European Union's way to say, to give the manufacturer a signal that, the, that they can say, we follow the European Union demands when it comes to these uh, physical demands like how what safety features against electricity overload a, a device has for example uh, there are a lot of regulations now the CRA comes in and says the if you have digital components if you have software as part of it you 
can put the CE mark on that also. Um, of course, a uh, business that claims they're following European law uh, can get audits. Just so you know, this is not like you, go, you, you start bragging. Somebody can come and check and see how, if you're actually following the law. And if not, there, there can be consequences. They um, also distinguish between, between critical products and regular product, products. This is a, a list, all of these are listed in, uh, in the Annex 3. Okay, one second. Here are some example, um, examples. Uh, class 1 was critical. That might be identity management system, network management systems, network monitoring systems, update and patch management. Class 2 software, which is not as has not as a high demand. With operating systems, PKI infrastructure, firewalls. There's a the long list. Um, Annex 3 has a full list. Um, there's the liability there also. The EU hammer is in this time a maximum 15,000 euro fines or 2.5% 2 2 of annual turnover. Million. million. Uh, yeah, sorry. 2.5% of annual turnover or 15 million euro, which is higher. And that's, th this is supposed to scare management to say, this, take this seriously. And uh, the, the same way of scaring management they did with the G GDPR. This is a tried and true method. So we can expect it to work. While the GDPR's maximum, maximums are a lot higher. It's like 4%, I think. I don't remember the... the hmm? 4%, yeah, uh, I don't remember the, f the million amount. Uh, the, the f and and, and it, 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 it kind of worked, so uh, I think it's safe to assume it'll, this will work too. This will be motivating. Um, what will the CRI, CRA ask us to do? Um, any devices and they're kind of loose, what they mean with device. Uh, it's easy to interpret, and many do so, that it doesn't even have to be a physical device. It could, they could just talk about software, that uh, you run somewhere in order to do something that has, interacts with this. So, so it, it basically means anything that talks online. Like a, a, a browser could be... A, like Firefox uh, uh, could be uh, uh, part of this. Uh, if you run a DNS server at work, that DNS server uh, could be part of, uh, applied to. Like, so uh, the NL, uh, NL, net, no, nllabs.net, there's a Netherlands, uh, uh, a Dutch company that kind of manages some of these open source projects, like Bind and... Uh, Bind, they, they huh? the competitor of Bind. Okay, they're the competitor. Uh, anyhow, sorry. They have one of those competitors to Bind. They had a hard look at this law and say, oh, hmm, we're kind of more like a charity. We don't have a business around this. We're just managing open source projects, which are going to be critical infrastructure. And we wonder, are we going to get the hammer hit on our hands? Uh, hands? And so that's the current discussion is, is, do open source projects that are huge and actually operate on in critical environments or important environments or that are, are affected by this law, do, do they... Uh, do they get the full attention of the EU uh, auditors? Uh, we'll see how that turns out. Um, but in this also shows ideas around how to update the software, each com component, how the chain of the supply chain to that, 
and they want to get best common practices up there also, uh, make it sane. Um, it, when it comes to, to figure out if you are a business is, if, if a business uh, wonders or suspects they, they, they fall, they, this law applies to them, they're expected to do a risk analysis, a self-assessment, and follow some guidelines to be uh, published. Um, and they, part of that, what they're supposed to do is to show that they've done the assessment, that they have established good procedures as a response for that on how to handle updates, manage uh, security incidents, all that stuff. And if they fail to do so because, hey, I, this is not my business or I don't do anything that, uh, I don't uh, have any toys that I sell with the internet, uh, but it turns out they are anyway, or they're just incompetent and don't do their job, they might get those fines. Um, so, now, whether or not open source software itself will be uh, uh, liable, or the projects or the developers, is a little bit of an open question at the moment. Uh, I'm assuming when the, word is, the wording of these laws are finished uh, 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 by the end of summer, hopefully, there was a couple more steps that has to go through Parliament, I think, and some other stuff. Um, it's, it'll still be pretty safe to be an open source developer, uh, but businesses will have uh, their lives changed in a, quite a few businesses will have their lives changed in a meaningful manner. Now, I saw a number a while back that um, in Germany alone, I think they expected around 40,000 businesses to be uh, uh, affected by this law. That's only Germany. Now, if Germany has, I don't know, a third of the European economy uh, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I, uh, we could think 100,000 uh, throughout Europe, EEA, and this, all those relevant businesses outside of the Europe that want to sell to the European market. They also have to take a little bit care of this. And they use somewhere between 60 and 90% of them, their code has some open source in it. Some of it might be Perl or, or gets downloaded from CPAN. That'll be interesting for us. Quite interesting. Um, I already talked a little bit of the concerns when it comes to demarcation, like what is an open source business or project. Uh, some frustration on that has been actually that the, the council who's, or the people who have made this who are working on this law, they haven't done much to actually reach out, reach out to open source communities at all. Uh, they made a huge effort to get small and medium businesses uh, get to, to, to speak up. So even if, uh, so, so, so they're doing some. They have they have had some mixed messages going on. Uh, uh, when they talked about this at Fostem, uh the guy from the U uh, European Union uh, on the panel said, "Well, it's kind of the duty of European citizens to keep up to tabs on upcoming laws." Uh, something like that. So that's a little bit of a fuck you kind of message. <laughs> so, but okay, at least some people started looking at it and said, oh shit, this might actually be serious. And uh, here we are. There's still some confusion going on there. But if we assume they solve those confusing stuff bits, there will be indirect ramifications. Let's see, can you guys see what's at the bottom here? So we have tens of thousands of businesses that will take a hard look of, at their stack, all their dependencies. 
they might find tens or hundreds or thousands of tiny open source co communities that they depend on maybe more depending on how rich of a product or, or back-end system the ecosystem they they have running or if they have lots of le le legacy code for example um, and they'll have to do a risk assessment judge it upon on is, is, is this updatable are these projects under some kind of management are they sustainable responsive are there any security risks good times lots of new eyes will check out the community how, how, how is the CPAN thing working hello uh, something like that new people they, these are people these are the kind of people who the more colorful people among us with a colorful language I mean will call the freeloaders the people who are just using open source and never giving back now they get a EU uh, motivated reason to actually interact with us we demand more <laughs> We might demand more. Uh, so from, from they will be all, not only looking at each individual project, but the rest of the community. Like you could say, like Neil says, there are, there's no C per community or there's no CPAN community. There's a whole lot of different communities. Well, we have kind of a meta community, like this room here with the Pearl Toolchain Summit. We're kind of a meta community. We care about the infrastructure that lots of other tiny communities use. So we are a support community of some sort. So they will be looking at our work at some point. What kind of tooling do we offer so they can get, get their shit uh, together? How, what kind of metadata do we have the required metadata in our st uh, stack? Uh, let's take questions in a moment. Uh, security risks will go there. Um, if there are any uh, problems, there might be uh, visibility around the, the fact. And if it turns out there are Python projects out there and the Python community isn't responsive, the business may say, I, I'm sorry this went ba bad and lots of people lost their power or whatever. But the Python community was not responsive when we tried to figure out what was going on here. This could happen with any community, including our own. I'm a little bit maybe painting a bleak picture here, and of course we can assume goodwill, but we should also assume that some people out there are just looking out to create some trouble and not be blamed and avoid fines. And there will be auditors, and there will be compliance officers, and they will be looking around to check if everything is okay. And if they don't, CEOs and CTOs will start to look around, well, who can we blame? Who can we, well, where did this fail? Uh, so the, all this stuff here might be directly problematic for a business. But when they get all the problems at themselves, they will turn around and look at us. Like this is the, the, we depend on these guys. So, so we're not. I don't think we're go, going to. We, we'll notice this. That's what I'm trying to say. And there might be some new business opportunities from insurance companies and stuff around that. I guess that uh companies like red hat and susa who do packaging might also uh, get some new business opportunities there so there's it doesn't have to be all bad um so for us okay let's kind of have a quick uh, pause for questions if there are any we have one in front here uh, uh, and one in back Look at um, yeah. My question is, um, I was not clear on exactly where 
this comes in as a requirement. Um, you were mentioning like the CE label on devices, electric devices. Yeah. And I'm wondering, can a lot of companies just avoid this by saying, oh, no, we don't follow that and yeah. just no longer put the label on? Well, uh, that, uh, that's fa fair, actually. And uh, so if we translate that comment that, uh, uh, well, we don't have to follow EU law because the CE mark is a claim that this company follows EU law. And if they don't put the mark on, then uh, in the EU, you don't get to sell that stuff. Okay, that, that's the part I was missing there. Yeah. I was so, wondering if it was like the, like the comic book compliance with ethics thing where they stopped the label and the world didn't end. So, okay. Yeah. No, a, a legitimate uh, alternative for somebody outside the Europe uh, would be to say, no, we, we're not going to do business with Europe uh, yes, anymore. Fuck you. Which is kind of okay for business, but on an open source uh, level, that's interesting like by because licenses are not supposed to have borders right but i mean could eu law be enforced on someone who's in the united states for instance if they want to do business in the eu but yes. an open source person um no the open source people they won't be affected directly but uh, if there's an American company that wants to uh, do business in Europe, they might go to the open source person and say, hey, um, we're a user of your software. We'd like to introduce some fixes that helps us to uh, follow these demands from the European Union. Could you uh, accept those pull requests? And if the person isn't available or doesn't want to, then we have a problem and we have to look at, they, that business has to look at like, okay, how can we resolve this? Should we fork? Should we have an internal uh, fork of it? Should we have some patch retrieve that is public? Should we just switch to a completely different project? Should we re-implement in Python or Rust? I hear that is popular these days. Let's re-implement everything in Rust. So there's a lot of, uh, this, this force might motivate a lot of businesses to think through those kind of options. Uh, Laura, uh, could you go there? Thanks. Okay, thank you. So y you mentioned uh, DNS uh, and companies hosting DNS. I was wondering where, uh, how, how do you think this would apply, for example, to a company that hosts a CPAN mirror and uh, whether they would consider removing it? I don't know. Uh, if, uh, like there's a risk assessment that has to be done for all of this, uh, which means the business who has its own CPAN mirror for whatever use, if it's like public, it might have a different assessment of what the risks are than if it's a, just a purely internal one for their own stack. Um, if it's public, then you yeah, have to look at the software in a diff with a different lens. Like, uh, is this secure in the, sense, in the ways that it needs to be? And then they have the motivation to reach out to the community that makes the CPAN the software, like if it's Pinto or AppOpen or whatever it is, MetaCPAN software, and say, hey, there's some security problems that we noticed that we aren't, doesn't seem to be okay, could we fix these? They have a reason to have a conversation. And as the law goes, the law doesn't dem strictly demand you fix problems. The, those two laws. So they, they, but they want to make sure that you are, have a regime in place where you have an idea of what issues you have and uh, you get uh, notifications if new issues arrive, like security, uh, uh, like CVEs or whatever. And now if you choose to ignore all that stuff for business reasons, or because the shareholders told you so, or whatever, it's too expensive, 
and you, this business gets an incident where they they get hacked their private uh, data gets stolen and they have to report it a huge media of us maybe fines they will come and say well it's possible to say, take a look at what they did and say well it seems you knew what was going on but you were neg negligent so all the laws might suddenly apply so so there's a like th these laws interact with quite a big picture of liability laws and stuff like that so this is also lawyer food so your company if they, they need some lawyers also to check if how how, how the actual landscape is for each business for your business one more question do the fines stack good if you have a deep if you have a DPRS problem and it involves NIS2 and CRA, do the fines stack? I don't know. I, I have no idea. It depends on your, on your lawyers. Yeah. I, I think there are... I'm, I'm not sure if there are different auditors uh, uh, or, or, or organizations that check if everything is okay. I think it's per country. And if you have an international build now in the business, the, the German uh, auditors uh, and the French auditors will both look at the same code and say, no, this is not okay, we'll find you. I, maybe they'll stack that. I have no idea, actually. But uh, I think the sums here should be motivated by themselves on their own. I hope so, at least. Okay, so I've, I've spoke, speculated a little bit about our ramifications. Um, so, uh, one way to get a full picture of dependencies is by using software build of materials. There's a couple standards out there that basically have where, where Perl and CPAN isn't on the radar at all. That needs to change. I'm looking into something that OVA does, that's called Cyclone DX. And uh, if you guys want to help in that work, you are very welcome to join the, that Slack server. There's a channel for Perl and Raku there that I made. Uh, happy to have more of you there. Um, funny thing, uh, uh, say the alien modules have their own dependencies that go outside of CPAN. Uh, those have to be represented somehow. I don't know how to do that, but it might be mean that the way how we uh, build the de like, or, or specify what dependencies we have in a CPAN file, for example, or all the methods, we need to have a hard look at that. Like it do, if, if you have a, uh, a module that depends on uh, another project I, or, or an executable, like bin slash bin slash ps just to get the uh, process tree that's a dependency that needs to be listed um, there's also a bunch of uh, tooling that probably needs when it comes to risk assessment so the making those s bombs means also get matching those up with any vulnerability database and uh, maybe some other kind of auditors uh, reports I don't know and of course there's the notifications um, by default has picked up SIP and audit again tries, I think he tries to keep that one alive I'm sure he'll appreciate to get some help there and <laughs> like anyone else um, We'll have to probably also look into uh, documentation and FAQs and training. Uh, there might be also some questions around how to handle uh, projects that don't have developers, like bus factor zero. Too many of those. And if a couple hundred businesses come and say, hey, we're depending on a bus factor zero module. We have to have an answer for them. Pick this list. If this is the top, start at the top. If this is uh, applies to you, 
here's how you can take a charge of this module. This is how you adopt it. That kind of documentation is probably useful to put on a central, easy findable, relevant place. Um, how to identify responsible parties, like the CRA has a bunch of demands of what needs to be in the metadata for a project. Like who is the security contact? Do you have an email address for any kind of uh, in, uh, stuff going on with uh, some software? That actually kind of needs to be part of the um, on, uh, of the meta spec, maybe something like that. And there's more documentation to be written, I guess. Uh, and another thing which might be useful for us is to just talk about how uh, teach these people how to be a good citizen in an open source community. Like how do you behave appropriately? Because these people are just used to getting code for free and suddenly they have to interact with us. What are the conflict resolution mechanisms? How, how do I complain? How do I solve problems? Who do I talk with? Um, and it sounds like a horrible thing, and I'm sorry to bore you with this stuff when I'm trying to scare you. Uh, it's pretty warm in here. But uh, this kind of prob this re probably requires some capacity building on our side. Somehow, I don't know who will have to do this, because we don't have money, this isn't our organization. The, the Perl Foundation would be a natural place to do this stuff. But they usually limit themselves on what they do, in, in my opinion, way too much. But uh, now there's actually a need for them to step up here on behalf of CPAN and Perl developers and this, these communities. Uh, or if, and if not them, we need to fix some other ways to do that. And some of these tasks might require having to hire someone to do some long-running tasks. Who knows? Like having a, a, a person who is the contact individual made available for all those businesses to answer questions and help them resolve stuff and interact with the community and individuals here might be a smart thing to do, at least for a period of time while these, these businesses will have to learn how to interact with us. And what are the options? They don't know about the governance models. They don't know of how, how to adopt a module. We we'll have to learn that, teach it to them. And a lot of businesses, I guess, will say, but we don't have people, we don't have competency to do this. And we need to be able to offer them options. Here's how you uh, donate, here's how you fund, here's how you become a, a sponsor or a partner. Partner with the CPAN or the Perl community. Put 10,000, put 50,000 euros into that account and you get to be called a partner for the next year. And that money can be used to hire somebody who does all that horrible, boring shit that none of us wants to do. And, okay, these links are for later. So, some consequences. I've tried to pick, paint a picture here. Uh, from their perspective, from the business perspective, they're going to uh, get asked to do a lot of security related stuff. They probably don't know how to do that, so they'll be hiring consultants and they will try to look for ways to save money. And then there might be many ways to save money. How do we reduce the cost of managing huge dependency trees? Uh, are there, is there existing tooling that we can use so we don't have to reinvent a, a wheel or two? Hopefully, we can have some existing community infrastructure that helps them do their job and get a good idea of what the landscape looks like. Maybe they're all their own, 
or maybe they take something that is open source and fork it for themselves. <coughs> or they could just say, well, we have stacks that uses five different ecosystems. Let's just reduce it to two so we don't have to interact with uh, those other. And uh, uh, for a Perl community who is already quite small, that might be a killer. Somebody says, well, now we have an extra reason to move away from Perl. Now, that can be mitigated if we say, hey, we have our shit together. We know what we're doing here. Here's the information. Here's how you do things. You get less problem and less risk by staying in the Perl community. Even if we're tiny, we have, we have a nice overview of what's going on. We have a good network of people. We have talented people, seniors, maybe. That's a picture we can paint that can counter some of those kind of thoughts. Um, some of those things uh, might just m mean more work for developers, but at the same time it could also mean that more developers come to the Perl community with uh, patches and the pull requests and it depends on how we play our cards and what we do. Maybe we'll finally have contact with the, with the Apple people who built their, their Perl completely wrong. Uh, yeah, the per Apple people who built their Perl stack completely wrong, was that what you said? Yeah, we need you. You need a microphone so that people understand what you're saying on the recording. Any uh, uh, Another thing which uh, might help us, since we're pretty much an open community, uh, transparency when it comes to security is actually a good thing. So playing uh, with open cards uh, it might be a positive signal to give to these people. Um, help them to manage what's going on. Uh, whatever we write, that it's in public, indexed with the uh, keywords so they can Google the, and uh, find the correct uh, solutions, all that stuff. And. Uh, we have to expect some people will move away from uh, non-responsive communities. Um, that's probably going to happen no matter what, but now they have an extra reason to make a decision instead of just postponing it. So what can we do about it? You guys have already talked, uh, heard, heard me talk about here. Um, if you have any thoughts, I think we could uh, just open the floor for, uh, like, is, is there something we should do about, uh, about any of this? I can think of a couple of things. I've already thought, offered a few. Um, share your thoughts, if you have any. Go. It's a bit much. <laughs> Yeah, it's a wall of text, a bunch of them, and it's, uh, this is lawyer food usually, but the problem is that uh, anybody who has published something on CPAN might notice what's going on here in a, in, in a while. It's still a few months away. Uh, the CRA thing will probably hit us this, uh, this fall sometime, or this autumn before winter, hopefully, uh, September, October, I, I don't know, depends on how, uh, how many, that much discussion there is. Um, the NIST 2 directive is already uh, decided and done. Now every country has to implement that and that's in October next year. So that one will be in, for, in force in uh, one and a half year, less than that. In the meantime, We'll have to think hard and see if we can make something easier. All right. 
Do we know any lawyers who can help us with fact-finding? Uh, I think this might be a reason for us to go to the Pearl Foundation and say, hey, um, could you hire a lawyer for a while to get us some real information around what's going on here and make an uh, impact assessment or something for this, these communities? That might be useful. If you have comments, just uh, raise your hand and I uh, will give you a microphone. And one thing I think would be one thing I think would be extremely useful is if we make an effort to the TPRF, for example, to say that they need to start uh, working harder at getting funding for managing this stuff, because this this isn't something you can do on a volunteer basis anymore. It really hasn't been a volunteer job for several decades now, some of this, but now we have to do something. And uh, quite a lot of this is also to avoid parallel work. Like if, if lots of businesses figure out, well, okay, we'll roll out our, our own solution and maybe there's some business opportunities there, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of a waste. And uh, the decisions we make on how what uh, data is exposed and what what uh, um, uh, file formats uh, we, uh, and standards we follow or or make an, or enable that can shape how things are going and how easy it is for those businesses to look at the Perl community and the CPAN communities and say, oh, this was easy. Okay. Given, given microphone given how basically all Perl source code comes from CPAN and we have all the metadata there we like, have most of what's necessary yeah it seems like having the SBOM generation support just in a standard place where you can just hit a button yep. and oh there it is it would be a huge win for Perl as compared almost any other language yeah, that make doesn't SBOM have a CPAN. as a final step after make install yeah yeah and have that SBOM for each module that's installed put into the installation directories at a sensible standard place yeah, possibly so. yeah but I mean also having them having them on meta CPAN so you literally just go to some random module on meta yeah. CPAN and just but oh the, there's the, the SBOM file. yeah the thing is that SBOMs are dynamic things because ah. they have to be constantly updated based on different sources like you, you look at the uh, if there's been a security uh, yeah. thing uh, going on somewhere and so, okay oh, okay this is yeah. the uh, the latest C uh, CVE that has to, that's, there's room for stuff like that. So an SBOM is meant to be dynamically generated as quickly as you get something in. And that right, means you have, right. to, we pick it from different places and whatever tooling we use, proposing that people use, need to have a, something machine parsable mm. available based on what is actually installed. Um, yeah. Could, could you just repeat what SBOM stands for? SBOM is a software bill of materials. Okay, so it's like uh, uh, a bill of materials in industry would be uh, what is this car made out of? Oh, okay, thanks. Physical stuff, the, the material demands, all that stuff. And that's so that you can trace where it made come fr came from. It was made in a, it's not like if, if, if you, sell something and it turns out it was made with child labor somewhere in Africa and SBOM is a, a, a bomb, a bill of materials is meant to help also detect stuff like that. So I'll ask the question from the opposite direction. Yeah. If we had uh, infrastructure in place to generate uh, SBOMs for CPAN stuff, what would still be missing to uh, uh, prepare us for the situation, basically. Well, I, I've suggested that uh, we should, uh, it, we, I think, would benefit from looking at the social community aspect here, like interaction, how interactions happen. 
and having uh, easy to find single point of contacts uh, or mm, documentation on how to operate uh, for, or find answers to certain questions. That might be a, a part of it. Um, how do we adopt a module, for example? Th that is that easy to find? Make it easier to find. Make sure it's easier to understand for people who don't know what's going on. Uh, are, like, uh, we get a new uh, audience now who not necessarily are uh, per developers or developers at all. They might be just some, some CTO that has some technical background and knew how they are to, to install Windows. <laughs> Or some, some lawyer who, who, who got the task to figure out something and they want to know what's going on, what are the risks. Lawyers are a lot into risk management, so having an approachable uh, documentation for the, that audience is probably uh, also very smart. Uh, <coughs> another question about SBOM, which is... Um so I just looked up Wikipedia, and the first C also was reproducible builds, which is, I guess, something different, but also extremely specific. Yeah. And when we take a CPAN module and we say, oh yeah, I depend on A and B, it's extremely vague. And so can we even build an SBOM, like a company builds something with Perl? Yeah. When you look on, on CPAN, there is no way they can figure out which version of what yeah. they use to build their thing because that is, you know, whatever or, happened on that day when they built it the first time. Yeah. So, or when they run make install. Yeah. yeah. So, this might very well be a reason to look hard at what's being installed. And, like, instead of just appending, uh, these modules were just installed add to some random file somewhere and then have the, the Debian uh, packages just ignore that file and notice. That, that's not good enough anymore. We need to have a proper log, for example, that tells them this is the version, this is the timestamp, this was the process that made the installation, this was the user that made that installation. Maybe that's enough, I don't know. Uh, this is, all of us know exactly how, how much of a mess that stuff can be or become, but it's, this is a reason to fix some of those things. You were talking about, um, you know, involving uh, TPRF at some point, because I'm thinking, okay, if adding this information, whatever information we need to Metasip and other places, is not trivial yeah. and it's a lot of work. We, we basically need to hire someone to do it. That's, uh, personally, I have, I have a lot of ideas on that. Uh, I would say if we have something which is easy to volunteer for, because like coding is fun, uh, or we have something which we'll do anyway because it's part of our job and it's okay for us to publish that stuff, uh, then it's okay, we don't need funding for that. But if it's boring or tedious or not something that is anything natural for us to easily start doing, uh, then might, we might need someone who can help. Now, the availability of these types of vo volunteers that aren't directly part of what we could call the, one of the Pearl of CPAN communities or types like us, most of those kind of people, we either have to pay to do a job or convince in other ways. We can go to a, someone like us who knows how to do things, but says, oh, wait, you know what, this is not fun. And you can go to their manager at their job and say, we need this person's time. Let, uh, uh, let's say the Pearl Foundation has money to spend on this and the Pearl P TPRF says, we want to buy 40% of his uh, employment to work on open source CPAN stuff, to make an agreement. So we have clear mind uh, and a paycheck to, uh, to motivate when, when fun isn't available as motivation. So that's a way to make something happen also. But uh, we'll probably need lawyers, and we'll probably need security experts who know this landscape much better than most of us. 
or, or, or somebody who is familiar with um, uh, how audits work uh, and what kind of expectations come there so we can make sure that whatever components that are needed to create the reports that the, that information those components are have what's ne necessary based on what each developer in their own distributions their own per packages add so there's and if you have a makefile.pl it's probably it's going to need another few fields saying this is our security contact email address these are uh, external dependencies we have uh, this is uh, this is the uh, make make sure have, for example having a, a uh, an, another reason for p regular developers to add the, that stuff which not everybody does like where's the bug tracker where's the the um, git repo that's going to be necessary in any case but now if that, that code is in use in a critical infrastructure environment it has to get in there somehow and that means more people will ask can you put this into that more pull requests and that will trigger new interesting questions because if the pull requests aren't accepted for some reason then the businesses out there will come to people like us and ask hey i can't get this security fix uh, uh, introduced uh, or resolved or accepted what should i do and it's open source fix it yourself <laughs> that's what they maybe tried but uh, they don't have the commit bit because they they don't have the they're not uh, accepted as co-maintainers maybe they want to be co-maintainer but it kind of has to be a, a conversation right can't just say you you this is your project but from now on that person will be your uh, equal we can't do that that's horrible so but the, the purpose of force <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that, that's like this is interesting topics. Like uh, yesterday, with, uh, with uh, no, yeah, yesterday, um, we had a, at lunch a little bit of a discussion ar around that with um, Graham and uh, myself, and Mickey nodded a little bit <laughs> and said, "Okay, this is." Uh, uh, Steve was there, and we are like uh, having a patch regime for CPAN modules with users offering, these are the patches I recommend to solve certain things that uh, uh, the upstream developer isn't uh, keen on solving themselves. Might be a way out of this. Make that into a formal part of how CPAN works. So uh, th this was very uh, informative and important. Uh, I think raising awareness towards uh, where the law is going. Uh, however, is is a, 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 and it, you brought us uh, a, a lot of actionables and stuff that could be used in general to to improve security and well-being of everyone that uses the ecosystem. But is this something because? It is not an actual law right now because it's still undergoing stuff. Do you think there's any actionable uh, things that we can do or that we should do right now? Or is this just something to keep on our radar and, you know, brainstorm some stuff? But, I mean, uh, half of this could go away or change in, in spectacular forms. I don't think uh, the... Uh, your assessment that this will just go away uh, quickly um, because uh, the, the okay last Saturday I, uh, like a couple of days ago I organized a conversation with one of the lawyers who was has been part of the CRA process and he used he was there because it was his uh, doctorate uh, thesis so he did that work as part of his thesis. I think he uh, got his doctorate this week. I hope so, or maybe tomorrow. And with Simon Phipps, who is uh, Open Source Initiative's uh, EU regula policy representative. Those two guys 
really are on the case when it comes to that. And we had a two-hour session with lots of good questions uh, on what's, what's going on and what are the different parts uh, uh, there. And the impression I got from them is that the, the, the core of these laws, they won't change. There are, no, there are a couple details around CRA that's currently in discussion. But uh, there, there's a public statement and uh, almost black and white based in the text that they don't want to kill off the open source communities because they think the innovation you get from there is uh, too beneficial and they, they want to keep that going. But they, they don't talk about secondary effects or tertiary effects, like what happens when like uh, 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 one tiny important project like that uh, XKCD uh, cartoon with like this little block that keeps up uh, the, this structure. And there's one guy in Nebraska who's keeping that one, uh, living in the cellar with his mom. Like that guy gets a denial of service attack from a thousand businesses who need to get help trying to fix that. Because they don't know how to cooperate and operate in an open, in an open source environment. They just, they just download stuff. They don't communicate with the community. And that is a learning process that needs to happen in the businesses. And at the RN is a preparation for that kind of scenario. How to make it, that kind of information easier available, keep, make it up to date. If there are some process changes that need to happen, make sure those process changes happen in good time before this big rush will come next year so that it's all ready. So some of that stuff might uh, need some hurrying in a sense. But that's more about like what, need, what decisions need to be in place. How do we want to operate when the storm comes? We know it will be a really bad weather. How do we prepare? And then after deciding how to prepare, we do the actual preparations and we have sort of a rough deadline next year-ish. It's not like everybody will come at the same time, by the way, so don't worry about that. Uh, but uh, it might, we'll see. It might be um, uh, that uh, they come often enough that people will get annoyed that, oh, this is a frequently asked question. Uh, that might be a signal that, that information isn't easily found, that the things they use when they Google, the words they use aren't match, match, don't match. So we, we might have to think about search engine optimization for those kind of documentation, <laughs> stuff like that. That's a pain in the ass, but like, uh, apparently we have to start looking at that. Uh, so if this happens next year, that means we must have a PTS next year. Yeah, which, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> probably. <laughs> we need a PTS. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, personally, I'm thinking we could have a benefit for a period now we have a PTS every half a year, actually. I'm, and I'm not kidding. It's a bit of work, <laughs> but... Um, a bit of? <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem organizing something. I've done it before. But uh, um, some of this stuff, needs decisions. We have a weekend here now, a couple of days where we can look at it. There are a couple document. There are a couple of those laws. The annexes there have a list of stuff that they expect, and we could just make sh update a couple of our uh, specs to match those. That should be able to uh, make something happen, and then we have to look at the tooling. Because I know that uh, if you want to make install and then make S bomb, there's some software that needs to be written. Why are you talking about S bomb again? Uh, I'm just surprised that you say that the S bomb was supposed to be uh, dynamic, because yeah. the purpose of a bomb is just not to be dynamic in the industry. Yeah. You need to know where this crew come from, um, and I don't think S bomb has. 
Well, it's I, difficult for me to, to consider that the S-bomb have to be dynamic. Well, the, the, the thing with, um, the reason I say it's dynamic, and I might be mistaken, but this, uh, so I'm, I'm still learning this stuff, stuff here. Um, my interpretation was that you don't update everything at the same time. You usually update only components. It's just like when you do apt-get inst uh, install some module, then you have maybe a picture of the, all the stuff that's installed, and you have to update a little bit of that whole picture because you just uh, a version uh, was bumped on one package, and that pr that principle goes throughout everything. And it's not only because you installed something with a new version number. There's all other metadata that is relevant to each package that also might update. That suddenly there's a CVE that is published. And the SBOM managing software, like Cyclone on the X or some of the other ones, I, I might notice this, look around, do we have this in use? Yes. Here we update that, and now we get a new report saying that, ah, oh, this is uh, something the management would like to know if we are up to date when it comes to security, uh, uh, security updates. And that's this, uh, this software tries to have. Uh, produce that, that kind of uh, information. And that's why I say it's dynamic. It's, it's not strictly like generated on the fly every time necessarily, but it needs to be partially updated. Refreshed from time uh, yeah. on As the you good go. basis. And you should never, uh, you should never uh, expect that it's frozen. And it, it, yeah. it, almost feels like, it almost feels like a build artifact yeah. Like when you release the new version of your website, when you deploy, sorry, the new version of your website, you generate that SBOM with every single version of everything that went into it through the build process. That's a way to handle the big picture. As reproducible builds is the same thing. It helps it's manage this picture. It is m both an input to be able to rebuild and a... Uh, an output of your build process yeah. to uh, prove that yeah. uh, is, which component yeah. are, coming, are coming from where. Uh, and uh, one, another major part of an SBOM is to be able to uh, correctly identify what you're actually referring to. And that means you have a SHA-256 hash of the code or the executable or whatever object uh, that you talk about. The, if it's this SHA hash here, then these metadata apply. Uh, and that gets pulled into whatever aggregating, aggregating system and pr pr that produces whatever reports. All right. Already talked about uh, life cycle, uh, the documentation stuff. Um, another one, which I think might be worth considering, and this is not maybe something we can do personally, but worth uh, talking with uh, TPRF with is looking at um, OSPOs because there are open, lots of businesses out there are starting to get of open source program offices some of them are getting fired these days because whatever reasons but it's still a useful type of institution to have in a business like an, a one little group, small group of experts that know how to interact with open source communities that care about licensing that makes sure that the legal environment is correct, that makes sure that the developers in-house know how to operate with open source communities. It's a teaching center, it's a, somebody who knows. That, that, that kind of resource would be very much interested in, in also knowing what's going on when it comes to those kind of reports that uh, are generated from the, the, what, the processes that uh, we have been talking about. And having uh, somebody at the Perl Foundation be a guide for those kind of uh, institutions saying, here's how you put together our community in your big picture for your business. I think that would be useful. And uh, there's also something more. Uh, I think it might be time to look a, take a hard look at our own community traditions. Because some of it might have to change. Um, 
the, the, the security culture out there is, has some clear differences from the culture we have. Because when we talk about there's more than one way to do it, like the libertarian ideal of freedom and uh, cho freedom of choice and freedom of how to work, that's like core to this community. And the, the, the heavy um, focus on backwards and forwards compatibility, super useful. What can we adopt from the security communities of attitudes and values to help us make better decisions that will last going forward? And do we have to tone down some of our traditions when we adopt some of those traditions? And that, that cultures. Maybe we should have a security summit, like the PTS, but for the security team. That's We're talking about help to companies, help to uh, groups, but what about help to authors? What should authors do to make it easier for the lawyers to assess yeah. Yeah. the modules? Because I can imagine that if I'm a, a very passionate programmer and I release my module and someone lawyer comes and you have to do this and that and I have no reason to do so I said I'll drop it yeah patches are welcome doesn't always work because the lawyer doesn't know how to code but they can tell you what you have to do and yeah um, uh, so yes uh, having a, a security track on conferences where people who come there get an idea. That might be something worth uh, uh, putting there. Uh, those places who still teach Perl might have to update their curriculums. Uh, maybe uh, we need some other ways to signal uh, culture that we have. Like, I don't know how that would go. One, thi one dream I had, uh, for example, was that if you wrote R in the shell and you use tab completion, I love tab completion. Maybe we need to say, have something that's called Perlock community or Perlock habits or something that tells us a little bit of the habits and the community features that we uh, appreciate and would like to tell people about. So w one thing I, I don't understand is, uh, so companies have to be able to say, I made this software and these are all the PCs I used and for any one of them I can track security, whatever. And some of it is unmaintained. Yeah. Some of it, so, so basically it's as if they were saying, yeah, I made this iPhone with rocks I found on the street. Yeah. Um, whose fault is it? Like who's responsible? Yeah, that's back to the liability question. And as far as I've understood, it's always the businesses that try to sell something that are with the final uh, liability. Um, so if, if they made a, a product that they managed to sell in the European Union, and that product is made out of gravel and chewing gum, uh, which some products they are made of, <laughs> it seems, and some uh, auditor comes and says, but this is gravel and chewing gum. Then they have to answer to that. That's uh, currently the case, but that, the R, uh, CSA or RS, whatever, yeah. the Resilience Act is, is being there to change that and move it down the chain. Yeah, no, it was, it, no the liability still stays there. Uh, so, but they will add uh, software to that kind of stuff. Like, uh, my picture of chewing on and gravel could include uh, open source pro uh, pro uh, projects like, uh, or components. And if those open source comp components are mostly okay, that's fine. But some of those will be, have the features of chewing gum and gravel. And that's their business's uh, reliability and responsibility to do something about that either by switching to something else or interacting with that project that is apparently too bad. Yeah, but to come back on this uh, um, auditing stuff, the, the, f the first point of this kind of uh, laws is to 
is that the, 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 the companies that are providing stuff are aware of the potential weaknesses in what they are producing. And depending on regulation, maybe they, sh they could just notify there is a vulnerability, a, potent, a weakness, at yeah. least. And uh, for some other business, they have to fix it. Yeah. And it, 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 that's maybe it's okay to, to build an iPhone with rocks found on the pavement, I don't know. But if, it's, if it has to come in, a, in an airplane uh, with uh, people inside, it's probably not sufficient to s just say, I found these rocks. Yeah, that's why this starts with a risk assessment, where the business looks at what's actually going on and what are, what are the risks, what are the uh, possible consequences, are we okay with that? And if they make a decision that this part here, uh, they accept it's made out of uh, bubblegum and, and gravel, then they document this, the decision of why they did that. So when the auditor comes and checks and says, oh, you're using something unsafe, and here are the reasons, they can nod and say, okay, those are good reasons, and we'll accept it, or he'll say, no, 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 this is not good reason, you need to fix this. So the point here, like um, for me, a major goal that he is trying to achieve here is to force businesses to have those kind of conversations. Like be aware of what they're doing, what are the dependencies, what are the risks, and force them to take a hard look at it. And, and that will include that they will turn around and look at the communities they depend on. But that doesn't mean that someone who, you know, someday published software and said, you know, do with it what you will, uh, no one is going to come knock on their door and say, okay, you owe us $10 million because your shit is, no. is not secure. No, so most likely not. Um, uh, that, I don't, that's not a risk. The developers are safe from the fines. The problem I'm trying to point, paint here is more about how, the behavior of those businesses and the people of the, in those businesses that they will probably have when they start interacting with the communities they depend on. Uh, shitty behavior, uh, coming with demands, uh, going out into media saying, oh, this project here is a danger for everyone. Uh, there's a whole lot of shit that can happen that doesn't, that's just bad behavior or that's uh, childish behavior or, or you could say they don't know better because they don't know how to interact with volunteers, with, uh, with open source community members or, or people who just like to code and they put some license on it and says, well, you get it as is and if you break it, you get to pe keep both halves. Well, while the licenses usually uh, have that kind of liability clause in it, it's really not that relevant in this case, because whatever, like if there is an actual problem in there, uh, the, the law of the land where you sit and work still applies. You cannot uh, remove demands from you from the law with a, a license that says you get as it is. You still have to follow the law if there are other demands. One, thing, uh, one point maybe to answer the, um, what Tex was saying about how to help the author. It, there are some tools like X-Ray or stuff like that that uh, scan uh, software to, to identify uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, they are based on list. I, I'm not really good in this software yet. Uh, they are based on list of rules and maybe uh, what things the Perl community could try to do is to make sure that uh, Perl is covered by those uh, kind of tools yeah. to scan the security, the, the vulnerabilities yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, so well, that's actually a really good point that we're figuring out what kind of tooling is already out there and how to get on their radars, what kind of data do they need in order to get the correct picture of what's going on from our uh, per, per community and our ecosystem. Super useful and a very good way of spending our time, I think. And a fun point here, there's something called the CVE Numbering Authority. There are a bunch of open source projects out there that gets to make their own CVE numbers 
because they have a good idea of what's going on, say, the, in PyPy, the Python Foundation, I think, have, they are a CVE numbering authority. I think we should have that too. I think uh, the security team, whoever that is, and the Perl Foundation should, should do that, just to be able to quickly say, okay, this is an issue, here's a CVE number, uh, with m making it part of uh, the reporting system. There is a There is a Perl 5 security group, yeah. and Rick is, if I'm not mistaken, the, the lead there now, and it's handled, so adding an extra number would not be the big deal. But that's just for Call Perl, right? Not for CPAC? Currently it is, correct. Yeah. No, something that is useful across the community, like all the communities, I think would be... I personally, I think that would be great. Um, there's a couple really useful links here. Uh, the Bird Hub link at the top here. Uh, there's actually two articles um, that uh, try to give a nice overview of this for, from an open source perspective. This has been a major reason why I said, okay, oh, this, people need to know about that shit because the guy, he, pay, pay, he paints a much more nuanced and complete picture than what I do. It's worth it definitely a read or twice. And that's about it. I don't have anything more to say. So we can have a final... No questions? Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I hope it has been useful.